Hello everyone and welcome to a new video on the Constructor Criticism YouTube channel. I'm Spencer, host of Constructor Criticism and Limited Time Only, two podcasts about getting better at Magic the Gathering. I'm joined by former co-host of Constructor Criticism, Matt Kling, yeah, GP no. Top 8 competitor. Yeah, it feels good. It does. <laughs> I went into Oasis Games and there was like written news. It was like Matt Kling Top 8 GP and people had just written random stuff so I, I yeah. added mine to that. Did you? I did. I did. Yeah, that's probably since I've been there then, so it'll be interesting <laughs> for me to find out. But I, I uh, you know, it's funny, because, like, Quentin and Matt are, like, the two people that I've probably played the most Magic with in my life, and it's easily, I was more excited for you guys qualifying for your first Pro Tours than me. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. But, yeah. like, but probably, a lot, I don't know if you feel that way about me and Quentin, but, like... No, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that... This Pro Tour invite, while exciting for me, because it's my first Pro Tour, yeah, wasn't right. as exciting as, you know... No, it's true, like, rem I, I remember, like, Quinn qualifying on Valentine's Day, and, like, just losing my mind. And you qualifying at this GP, like, I, I, I definitely wasn't rooting as hard for me at, at the RPTQ as I was rooting for you at this GP. Right. Like, and, and I think that that's good, right? Like, you want to yeah, surround yeah. yourself with people that want you to succeed as much as you want to succeed yourself... Um, so I kind of want to go over the tournament for you. We were going to do a video on the matchup with Eric Froelich, or not Eric Froelich, uh, Brad, Brad Nelson, Nelson yeah. but uh, maybe we'll still do that in another video, but right now I just kind of want to talk about just the tournament. So um, the first thing that I want to do is kind of go over your deck list. Um, so uh, day one, obviously, you we'll just start this by saying you did go 8-0. Uh, your deck list was two Chandra Torch of Defiance, two Dire Fleet Daredevil, I love this, uh, four Glint Seed Siphoner, love it. One Gonti, three Scarab God, one Gear Hulk, four Whirler, two Q, one Search, uh, fourteen instances, including what? By the way, no sorceries in this deck. That's a fun fact. Uh, one of great. The confiscation Qs are sorceries. Oh, it just has it wrong. No, oh, no, I it, just it, said it. Yeah, you just said it. Right? I just said it. All right, I just didn't even think about it. All right, uh, one of braid, one commit. I love the one commit. Uh, four Harness Lightning, three Magma Spray, one Supreme. Love the one Supreme well. Uh, four Rasa's Contempt, 26 lands. We have four Aether Hub, four Kenya Slough, uh, four Dragon Skull Summit, four Drown Catacomb, three Fetid Pools, one Island, two Mountain, three Spire Bluff Canal, one Swamp. But really quick, one of the things that that Michael said about this deck on the podcast, because we kind of went over this as the deck of the week this week on Constructor Criticism, is he loved the fact that you, quote, got to play seven cycle lands. How did you feel about that? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think the mana base looked like it was going to have basically a million tap lands. Um, first of all, we got we got this list originally from uh, Peter Sikoric, I think is his name. Okay. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce his last name. Um, but anyway, so we got this list from him, and uh, at least the bones of it. And yeah, we looked at the mana base, and originally we're like, you know, we're going to be playing a turn behind the entire match. Sure. Um, and what happens is you play the tap line turn one, and then you get to play it on tap line. Yeah, basically, as it turns out, you basically never play more than one cycling land in a game. Yeah, uh, you'll play your first cycling land, and then it's like all check lands, basics, spiral of canals, aether hubs, and then you just cycle away sure. all the extra. Does it lands. does it remind you of the times where you would play like your your uh, your shock lands tapped, and then you would just play check lands the rest of the game? Yeah, it's kind of similar to that, except for the now the shock lands you know draw you cards in the late game. Sure, that seems way better. <laughs> yeah. So okay, so uh, one question I have about the mana base is: Did this feel better than the two color mana base? One of the things that Michael said is like what you were actually better off playing three colors due to the check land cycle land mana base than the yeah, traditional I, I, two I color think, mana I think, base. I think that's true. I mean I, I think specifically in blue black mid range, the mana is actually pretty bad. Uh we talked about this multiple times over the GP, Michael and I. Um and I think that you mulligan a lot with that deck just due to mana uh constraints. Uh, a lot of the reason is that you end up with so many basics that you just don't have sure. the things that produce your colors. Like you can you can definitely end up in awkward situations with this deck where you don't have the exact colors you're looking for on turn two or whatever. Yeah. But it's fine because you have other colors or spells to bridge the gap. Uh, in blue black, also trying to run gifted aetherborn is really tough with like four aetherbs and sometimes yeah no like, the botanical I mean, and one of the my favorite decks in this format so far was the soul tie green black deck that's just playing like Veraska. And one of the problems that you have is like I have to use my energy to cast my spells, which does make my glinsey ciphers a little bit worse. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that we have here, I, I kind of we talked about this on the podcast, but I, I would love your opinions more than just Michael's. Is let's just talk about the one of really quick. So we have one of Gonti, 
I love it. One of Girok, I love it. One of Search, I love it. One of Commit, I love it. And one of Supreme Will. But I feel like some of your one-ofs actually have there's, to do with your one other one-ofs. There's, there's a one of a braid as well, but that's actually more like the fourth Magnus braid. That's actually the slot that we used that I, for. I, that was actually... Uh, my thought was that you played this as your fifth Harness Lightning, so I didn't count it. But it uh, fourth Magnus Ray, same right. same deal. Um, so I agree with you. Uh, on these other one ofs, I think Search fits with Gear Hulk. I think that Supreme Will fits with Gear Hulk and Commit hit, fits with Gear Hulk really well. And like this is a Gear Hulk package, right? Is that how you felt about it? Uh, certainly, to some extent. Uh, believe it or not, a lot of the a lot of the ones were pretty hedgy for certain matches that we thought may or may not be popular. Uh, like commits memory specifically was like kind of a nod to uh, Blue White God Pharaoh's gift. Sure. Uh, while also being pretty great in any kind of mid uh, mid range mirror. Why don't you talk about the God Pharaoh's gift and why you felt that way about it? Just being able to commit it. Yeah, being, before so like pre combat. If, if, yeah, if they refurbish a God Pharaoh's gift and you commit it, it's basically exactly the same thing as countering it or destroying the God Pharaoh's gift for. Right, because yeah, they can't cast several it. Several turns, yeah. Sure. Um, and then also, not, not, not for nothing, you can actually memory their graveyard away, which makes them have to restart completely. Yeah. And and for you, being 7 versus 7 for them is actually okay. Yeah. Because, like, you're also going to be able to cast multiple spells in the turn just like they are. Uh, they have a lot of setup costs, too, right? Like, it takes, right, the, it yeah. takes them quite a few uh, spells to actually get things... And like they have to be able to get either it into the graveyard again, or kind of what you were just saying. Like, right, yeah, so, like, that, that's what I'm saying. Like, they can't actually play Godfather's Gift on 7 after you uh, after you memory. I mean, they can, but it yeah. just doesn't do anything. One of the things that we'll get to later is Carnage Tyrant. How much did Carnage Tyrant come into your thought of playing Commit? Uh, Carnage Tyrant actually didn't factor in at all. I didn't expect a lot of Carnage Tyrants at this event, and I did end up losing to it, so, it, you know, just But the punished. fact that you have Commit actually is better than not having it against Carnage Tyrant. I'm, I'm failing to see what Commit does against Carnage Tyrant. It actually... It, well, sure, on, yeah, the stack, on, on the stack, yes. It on the actually stack, helps. You're, you're absolutely right, yes. Helps. Um, one of the things that, and, and, uh, that Quentin and I, in our blue backlist that we currently like, is the fact that Commit plus uh, Field of Ruin... Stops trying to turn and gives you extra answers. Sure, just shuffling away. Yeah. Um, and even in your deck, being able to commit it might actually give you enough turns to win the game pretty often. So I think... And especially with Torrential Gear Hulk. Right. So I think that the best the best answer to the Carnage Tyrant is just the Scarab God. Yeah. Um, and I think that's true in any deck that's playing the Scarab God. And sure. Which, which is most of the deck you're bringing in uh, yeah. Carnage Tyrant against. But One of the card choices that you made is two Chandra's Torture Defiance. Uh, we saw a lot of 1-1 one -one splits between Chandra and Liliana. Is there a reason that you didn't like Liliana? Michael hates the card, so I'm curious on your thoughts. No, I think I think Liliana is mostly fine. Uh, I do think Chandra is a lot more high impact. I like the fact that it's a modal spell, whereas Liliana basically only does one thing, right? It's, Two things. Well, well, one thing it mostly first. does one thing, right? Like, sure, it does the same thing. So I mean, it could definitely reanimate a creature on the first try in this deck. Sure. I mean, I'm just saying, like, it basically just puts a dude in play, right? That's the only thing it does. It's that, mostly that's true. not going to impact the board in any other way. Yeah. G D D. Did you feel a lack of that kind of inevitability that Liliana gives you? Because while Shutter can give you that, your deck's not really good at protecting her the way other decks are. No, it's definitely true. I mean, I did emblem a couple of Chandra's that weekend, but it was mostly in matchups where I didn't feel like there was any other way I could win. Sure. What the is the one of Search because you're playing Gear Hulk, or did you actually just like Search before that? I think that Search is kind of a nod to the mirror, mostly. I think if you play a Search for Kanta on turn two, it's going to be great all the time. Uh, as far as it being a one of, it's mostly just because we didn't feel like we wanted to have more than one against Model Red. Like if you draw yeah. the second one, it's pretty bad, but the first one you can usually slot in somewhere. I feel like the first one is good in every matchup. That, that's where I'm really going. Yeah, you yeah, can slot and in the first one somewhere. The second one is is really whatever. Awkward. <laughs> um, so let's talk about really quick. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people weren't doing that you were doing that I love is Dark Fleet Daredevil. I this card is is probably two of in all of my Red X for a while going right. forward. Like. The ability to say your best card against me is now also going to be used against you, right. and and like in certain matchups you can play it on turn two, but you don't have to. It fits into your curve where you wanted to fit. Whether it's a fatal push, whether it's a you know whatever is going on in the matchup, this card fills that role. Not not I actually think it does a better job of it in standard than Snapcaster did because of the way that standard lines up right now. I think the fact that it has first strike is actually really relevant in standard right now. Um, as far as you know, it filling in your curve, it definitely does that. Although they did show most of the matches where I actually got a spell back with it on camera, 
Uh, I actually cast it as a two one first strike a lot of a lot of the time. Yeah. No, I I mean I've I've tried your list a few times and I've cast it as a two one and yeah. just been like yeah like I don't know what you do other than casting a spell to beat this but I'm fine for you one for wanting this right. because I'm going to gain the advantage in the long game anyway. Right. It's I mean it's worth noting too that you actually get to exile the card regardless of if you cast it or not. So if you're no, it's against, true. If you're playing against control, it's nice to just be able to get a fatal push out of there. Um, yeah. One of the things that we have here is your sideboard and I, I'd like to go over that really quick because. Your sideboard is one Gonti, uh, one Torture Defiance, three Chandra's Defeat, two Duress, two Sweltering Suns, three Renegade, one Dead Eye Tracker, one more Braid, and one more Gear Hulk. I like to talk about a few things really quick. Uh, the first of is the second Gonti. I think that having two Gonti in your 75 in this deck is actually important right now because it gives you an advantage in the mid range mirror that those other mid range decks would gain if you didn't have this card. Yeah, that's definitely a factor. I think the nice thing about Gaunti is that it kind of slots in in a lot of places where you just have dead cards. Because um, Gaunti's almost never a dead card, right? No. It's going to generate card advantage, and it's going to be pretty reasonable. And before this standard, I actually hated Gaunti. I was like, man, this card is so bad in every matchup. Like, it's slow, it's clunky. And in this format, like, it, it's good in everything. Yeah, I, I mean, I think so. Like, Mono Red's the place I really don't like it that much, yeah. but every other matchup is pretty slow. So, yeah. like, generating the card advantage actually matters. So, one of the things that we have here is a Chandra over maybe another type of Planeswalker, whether it's Liliana, whether it's Nyssa. You decided for the third Chandra. Tell us about that. Well, I think we wanted the Chandra mostly for curve considerations. Um, you it's, didn't it's, want a 5-drop? Yeah, we just didn't want, like, Angrath or uh, Liliana or anything like that, because oftentimes we're boarding that in against Control where we want to be able to sneak a Planeswalker in low, um, or even in the mirror, like, being able to play Chandra on 4 is a lot... It's not necessarily more powerful than Liliana 5, but it is easier to protect. Yeah, one of the things that we have in your board that I appreciate, and and I think that not enough people appreciate, is Wrath Effects. And the thing is, is I don't care if it's Sweltering Suns, I don't care if it's Golden Demise, I don't care if it's Bondu's Last Reckoning, but I think that a way to clear out... So one of the ways that Midrange and Aggro loses in this format is like to an unanswered uh, tokens build-out. Right. And if you don't play Sweltering Suns or Golden Demise or Bontus, the way that they actually can't stop you on your main phase. So if you play a Wrath Spell on your main phase, it usually actually shuts the deck off for a couple turns. Because they have to build out their strategy so much during their own turn through the beginning of the game that they run out of cards pretty quick. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, Sweltering Suns is another really hedgy card that we had. Yeah, no, it is. I mean, you could have easily played. I mean, you could have played yeah. Bantu in this slot. You yeah, could have certainly. played uh, Gold Demise in this spot. You could have played Yohan Yohani's Expertise in the slot. Well, not, not even just that. I'm saying it's hedgy to even play the Wraths at all. Like, I actually don't think that... I mean, most of the lists that you see actually aren't playing any Swell Thringsons or any kind of Wrath no, I, sideboard. No, that's true. And what I'm saying is that when you think about, like, a GP metagame versus a PPDQ metagame, I actually think that I would rather have the Wraths than not because of the diversity of matchups you might face. Yeah, that was the idea, right? Is that we didn't think that most of the decks we'd need Sweltering Suns against would be good, but the fact that you do have to play them means that we were willing to dedicate two sideboard slots to try to, like, yeah. give ourselves and, out in those matchups. And depending on the type of either Mono Red or even some of the Mardu matchups, you might actually be okay bringing in Suns against it. Yeah. It kind of depends, because, like, there are times where Sweltering Suns are really bad against Mono Red. Right. Uh, so we did bring this... We did build this sideboard with a pretty specific plan against uh, both mono red and blue black control. Like, tell us. Basically, the way that we started the sideboard was we decided which cards we did not want in those matchups because we expected blue black control and mono red to be the most uh, sure. popular decks. We not said, blue black mid range. No, not blue black mid range. Even though it was fairly popular online, but we expected blue black control to be sure. the popular deck. Um, so we built this deck, considering which cards we would want to side out in those matchups, and then filling out the sideboard slots to accommodate that. Well, also, you know, you have to overlap some of these cards because sure. you just don't have that many sideboard slots. So what cards did you want out against Mono Red? Gaunti is pretty obvious. Uh, so let's see. Against Mono Red, we were boarding out Search for Azkanta. Um, Gaunti, probably. Yeah, we were boarding out Gaunti. We were boarding out... Did you board out a Scarab God? Yeah, and we might have boarded out one Scarab God. It's hard to remember right now. Let me think. So what cards we we brought in three Chandra's defeats, and the abrade. So we brought in four cards total in that matchup. Okay, so one search, one Gonti. I would assume search for Gonti. me it's probably Scarab God I, something yeah, else. I, I believe it was Scarab God and 
Was it Commit? Oh, no, we boarded out both the Chandras. That's what it was. So it was, it was two Chandras, uh, Sir Tereskanta, and Gonti were the outs there. Okay, so you kept in all three Scarab Gods. We That's did. not actually terrible, because I think that, like, they actually can attack through a Scarab God every turn to gain an advantage pretty often. Right. Unless they're hazard advantaged, which means that you're disadvantaged anyway. I also think that it's important in a deck like this to actually have a way to close the game out. Like No, it's true. I think in the Team or Black decks or whatever, it was it was fine to board out the Scarab Gods because you actually had ways to close the game. Versus right, the Bursting Hydra was so right. good. <laughs> Um, but so if again, wait, if you wait around long enough, they'll just bring yeah. it out against blue black control. I mean, you this this is a bit harder, right? Like you we probably have a lot of sideboard cards from blue black. Yeah, I mean, you have Gonti, another Chandra, two yeah. Duress, three Negate, and you could even bring in that Gear Hulk and possibly the Abrade because it's so much better than some of your other removal spells. Yeah, we even board, we boarded in all those and and the Gear Hulk. So yeah, we boarded yeah. in almost the entire sideboard against Blue Black. Yeah, so the only thing you're not bringing in there is the two Sweltering Suns, the Dead Eye Tracker. No, the only thing we're not boarding in is the two Sweltering Suns and the three Chandra's to be. We definitely boarded in the Tracker. Oh, you did board in the Tracker. Right. So here, here we're probably thinking about boarding it, boarding out. Uh, you know, just basically, uh, are you boarding out all four Harness Lightning, three Magma Spray, and then two Contempt? Yeah, we were boarding out two Contempt and one of the Confiscation Coups. That's fair. I right. can see boarding out one of the confiscation coups. That that still leaves you with a couple of slots. Are there creatures that you didn't love in that matchup? Are you boarding out like a whirler or No, I don't I don't believe we did that. So that's it it was a uh, so we boarded out four harnessed, three magma spray at seven, two rescue attempt is nine. Nine. And then a coup is ten. A coup is ten, right. So we have three negates. And that's ten, yeah, that's ten. Yeah, two duress. Okay, that that actually equals out. So uh, you have a very clear cyber plan, which is, like, honestly the best way to build a deck. Like, if you are building a deck at home, and you're wondering what cyber cards you can... I mean, think of the number of times, Matt, where somebody's come up to you at, like, an FNM or a Wednesday event or a PPTQ, but they're like, hey, tell me what you think of my cyber plan, and you see four naturalized on their sideboard, and you're like, where do you want these four naturalized? Right. The actual best way to do it is, like, here's the main deck configuration I want and why, and... What do I need to do to complement that in the matchups that I expect? Right. I mean, that, that's certainly a good way to do it. I would oh, or an extension, I would, of, I would or say an extension of your main deck. Is the, ac yeah, the actual best way would be to build a 75 card deck, deck and then decide which 60 you want to play. Yeah. Um, no, that's actually fair, too. An extension of your main deck is another great way to do it. We actually talked about that this week. Our podcast this week, if you didn't listen to it, was the was the podcast on your 75, right? So it was like... What are one? What do one of us mean? What do two of us mean? What do three of us mean? What do four of us mean? And then how do you implement that into your entire seventy five? It was a, a good podcast for deck building itself. But I think we've covered your deck list, your sideboarding plan pretty well. Yeah. Let's talk about your internet record. So uh, it's really funny. I've always told Danny. Danny makes fun of me all this. Makes fun of me for this all the time. We've talked. I've told Danny. I was like, Yeah, I've never uh, gone undefeated at a GP. And we were talking about day one. He's like, Yeah, I've never gone undefeated at a GP either. I think that's super rare. But you actually did go undefeated day one of a GP. Um, first of all, how did that feel? No, it felt really good, actually. Um, I was... Uh, I mean, X1 feels amazing. That's yeah, something I mean, I've done before. And it's like, the thing you is, feel on top of the world. Right. So I can only imagine what it's like. The thing was, it was it was kind of passing by really quickly. Like, I didn't really take time to appreciate each match individually. It wasn't like, oh, man, I'm 6-0, I'm 7-0, you know, like... I just, like, we finished the day up and I was like, oh, I got... I mean, actually, they told us before the match, they said, you know, if... Whoever wins these matches, make sure to come get your photo taken or whatever, because you'll be the one of the undefeated. And I was like, oh, okay, you know. Yeah. And then like I won the match. I was like, oh, I guess I made out day one. That seems like a pretty good start. But the whole time, what I was actually thinking was, man, I still need to win so many matches to actually make. No, you do. And when they cut down the rep, like nine oh eight day one was like. Yeah, nine oh eight day one is a great start. It, it's like, it's pretty hard not to make top eight, right? Like. You first of all, for, for I mean, a few reasons, you're doing pretty well. one, because you're doing well, right. two, because like your deck is probably pretty good if you've gotten to the point where you've 9-0'd. Now, not, that's not to say that like people have not 9 day ones and not made top eight, but like, there's something going right for you yeah, at this tournament. You mostly, you probably found some kind of a niche in the metagame yeah. if you're starting out 9 And I, I now, I've never gone into... I have 8-1 to a tournament, right? So I've had 8-1's eight, eight day one, right. uh, and it was, it was the best feeling in the world, dude. It was like... Well, so my very last individual GP, I actually started out eight and one, and then in day one. So. Oh yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, you, yeah. now you have two eight win. Eight, eight, eight wins is like yeah, it, it's it, definitely you. Strong. You have so many more lot wins than losses, right. and now you have you know all wins, no losses. <laughs> and now that they've made this change, is there any key moments you really remember for day one? Um, 
I, I'm mostly just capitalizing your opponent's mistakes. I had an opponent. He seemed like a really good magic player. This but, is the mono red opponent. Yeah, he was playing mono red, and he at one point attacked with a hazard, and then I realized he had two cards in hand. So I was like, well, you know, you can't attack with hazard with two cards in hand, and basically we got a judge involved, and then he ended up. It ended up being decided that he was in his declare attacker step and had yeah. to make a legal attack at that point. Yeah. And it was a, it was a razor tight game. I was playing. Uh, sorry, he was actually playing red black vehicle. Sure. But it ended up being a razor tight game. Um, I basically won that game by inches, and I think that if he atta attacked with the hazard right there, I probably lose that game. So is this a, a moment of you being conscious of your game? Because I, you know, it's it's funny. It's actually funny because like. Uh, we won't get into the specifics, but like, if there's a, a reminder to me to be conscious of my games, you were in the topic of a PDQ in Boise, I think, and you asked your opponent how many cards they had in hand, and it was like, way more than they should have. Right. And, to me, it's like, do you call a judge at that point? How do you prove it? Like, what's going on? But, like, you were invested in, in an individual moment that was pretty easy to call a judge about. And I think that if you feel that way throughout the game, it's pretty easy to just play the game, right? Like, people get so focused on their opponent's cheating. I don't think your opponent's trying to cheat here, right? Like, they're just like... No, he, uh, he no. had the man to activate. Had no, he could have just done it. Yeah, he just, and he he just, just did it. Yeah, yeah. It had nothing to do with and, cheating. And, I mean, and this is something that we even saw in the pro topic, right? Like, right. P PV versus... Uh, what's his name? Yeah. I, uh, I don't recall the guy's name right now, but it was yeah. exactly the same scenario. It, exactly the same yeah. scenario. How do you uh, keep going here? Because obviously you've got an advantage here. Right. They can go to your head. Uh, when we were talking about it earlier, you were saying that your opponent now had to start playing to the board. Yeah. So I mean, I, the game was actually really tight. I wasn't even. It wasn't even clear from my side whether he was supposed to attack with the hazard that turn. Sure. Um, basically, I was like trying to win this game with the World of Virtuoso and a couple of Thopters, but his life total was like a bit less than mine. Like he was at like four and I was at five or whatever, so it was, yeah. like, really tight. Um, but he basically had to play creatures to the board every turn, so he wasn't able to activate his Hazret, even though it was in play for several turns. Right, because he can't discard extra cards because he's using that mana for other things. Yeah, well, here's... Yeah, that's exactly right. Like, he couldn't discard the last card in his hand ever because he just didn't have that many lands in play. Right, because if you have four lands, right. you know, you paying two to keep a creature in play. Exactly. That, that extra mana is just two lands sitting on the battlefield you can't activate it. Yeah, exactly. Is... is is this a matchup you're happy to face? Like, is Mono Red good for you? I think Mono Red is. That matchup was not, for what it's worth. Like I said, it was Red Black was worse for you. Yeah, the, we, you know, we made the pretty big concession to Heart of Kieran when we decided to play all Magma Sprays over. Okay. I fatal, mean, you have over Fatal Pushes. Yeah, you have you have three Magma Sprays, zero Fatal Push, one a Braid. Right. Yeah. So I mean, your Harness Lightnings have to do extra extra work in that matchup. Definitely, and it's it's actually pretty hard to have. Four energy on, or you know, one energy just lying around on. Two yeah, as somebody who's played a lot of Jeskai Control, I mean, uh, I think today is my one year anniversary of winning a PPDQ with Jeskai sure. Control. I remember Heart of Karen versus Jeskai Control, and like, you, this is something you had to think about a lot. It was like, I can use this energy, but like, if they play a Heart of Karen, yeah, then I just then have this Harness Lightning is actually <laughs> just a dead card right. outside of killing the thing that they crew with, which actually isn't that good. I mean, it can't. It, so it depends on what it, like with. Toolcraft Exemplar specifically, it can be good. Sure. Because, like, you can kill it before they can right. through, But So, with that said, how are you feeling at the end of day one? Yeah, I mean, I was definitely feeling pretty good, obviously. Like, uh, yeah, after after day one, I believe, yeah, Paul definitely bought me dinner that night for, you know, 8 owing day one, so that was kind of cool. <laughs> Paul Farnsworth? Paul Farnsworth, yeah. Just was like, I'm yeah. buying you dinner? Yeah, that's what literally the word Hashtag said. easy... <laughs> like yeah. whatever. Shout out to Paul. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, no, I think that like, uh, I, I, it's actually funny. Uh, GP so Lake, like, I'm eight one, and uh, it's easy the best I've ever finished the GP, and day one, and and I just remember uh, Quentin, myself, Josh Wheaton, and, and Casey were like, we went, we, you know, we got Chick Fil A. Somebody bought me dinner too, so it's like right. it, it is. It is inspiring to like have your friends. Yeah, it definitely helps. I mean, it's just a it's a nice thing to do for somebody, and it doesn't really cost you that much. And if it, it's like, like, hey, good job, keep yeah. going. So let's go to day two. Uh, I want to just say that your day two started off really well. Yeah, it did. Like again, it was like almost. It was. It almost it's a happened, dream phase, right? It like, almost happened so fast that I just didn't even notice it happening to me. Right? Like yeah, I. It was funny because uh, you know. 
myself and others, we're following this really closely. Like, Matt is one of our best friends. Like, he's a very good Magic player that we've been rooting for for a long time. And uh, I remember when you were 11 and 0, I was like, I think he's locked. Like, I think he needs one more win. Like, how he started for this event was so good that not that much more is needed for him to get to where he needs to go. Um, I remember, and then you played against Brad. Well, so I... Oh, Brad was the 11th yeah, Brad match. was the 11th match. Right? I remember this. Actually, yeah. actually, I had to play against Corey Baumeister and then Brad Nelson right back to back. So, it was actually your match against Corey, so that might have been the Tenno match. That was the for Tenno. That was the one that I was like, this is it. Like, yeah. he's he has something. Uh, how did you feel after your Corey match? Uh, pretty good. I mean, I... Honestly, I was in favor to win game three. Uh, but he ended up drawing a fair amount of lands in a row. Sure. And, you know, it's just magic sometimes. But yeah. I, mean, and, I, and think, I think we both played pretty well that whole match. I actually wish that that match would have been on camera because I thought that was a little bit more, more interesting, interesting than, the Brad. than the Brad one. But that's actually why we didn't do the Brad video is because, you know, Brad had a mold of five. Uh, the, so they, they really surprised me on camera with the, like, literally like 30 seconds after we were done with our match. Like, hey, you want to do an interview? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And then they're like, okay, right now. Like, okay. Yeah. Sure, with your with Brad. Yeah. No, the so, um, the Brad match was interesting for a lot of us at home, and I, I think that what what was interesting is that if you looked at these decks on paper, it does actually look like Brad's deck would be favored. Maybe I I kind of disagree. I mean, having played the deck before, sure. I, I kind of know that they again take a, some amount of time to. So how out. much how much do you value Charter Cores and Champion of Wits? So I think that those cards are both pretty good. The, the problem that they have is that their Glint Seeds Nightmares are so much worse than mine. Like, they are. They are worse than yours. And, <laughs> and that's specific because, like, your Harness Lightnings can kill, like, X1s in their deck and make your Glint Seeds so much better. Well, so they're worse because they're not drawing a card every turn, first of all. But they're also worse because my Glint Seeds Nightmares are a lot more likely to live than theirs. Like, Why I is have, that? I have just way more removal spells than they do in the blue-black deck. Like, specifically oh, because they're just Fatal spells. Push... They're just fatal push for us as condemned. Yeah, exactly. And okay. I have you know magma sprays, harness lightnings, a braid, like and brassicas contempt. Sure. So, so you beat you beat Corey. Really attack into Whirler Virtuoso. Right? You beat Corey. You then play Brad. Right. You literally probably know they're on the exact same team. Oh play. yeah, I, I absolutely knew. So what what is what is your going through your mind as your Brad match is playing out? Uh, I was thinking a little bit about how much. Uh, Information I divulged to Corey the round before. <laughs> okay. You know, uh, we talked about it a little, and I, I just told him, you know, I'd played against Corey, and I'm sure he already knew him, but like, yeah, know, we were just making small talk, and sure. you know, he, he made some comment about how he couldn't let me beat both of them, and you know, and then you did. Turns out he was wrong. Yeah. Was just... <laughs> uh, I, after the, the match with you, he tweeted that the 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 Bash Brothers era had ended. <laughs> So you ended the Bash Brothers era. How do you feel about that? What, what is the Bash Brothers era? So uh, if you're not fa familiar with the, the D2 Mighty Ducks era of the Mighty Ducks, the Bash Brothers are the are uh, the enforcer from the D1 movie. Okay. And then when they go to the U.S. team, they inv they invite a new enforcer into the, uh, the, the Mighty Ducks hockey team. Okay. And they are called the Bash Brothers. Okay. So uh, when Brad and uh, Corey went on their tear, their insane tear, like the, probably the it has to be the most insane tear in Magic. Where like I think they topped it in like seven or eight GPs in a row, yeah, either both of them or one extreme, of them. Yeah. It's it's unreasonable, and it's, it's it was only constructed GPs. But then if you included limited GPs, it kept going somehow. Right. Like it it was pretty unreal, and uh, you know you did end that, so. Uh, either anti shout or pro shout I'm not sure which. Um, is there is there key moments outside of those two matches that you really remember from that four zero start on day one? From the eight zero start? No, the four zero uh, start, start on day two. The four start on day two. Uh, well, I mean, those were half my matches on day one, day two. <laughs> sure. Um, let's see what else. Did I, I mean, what what happened in round twelve? Nobody got to see that. You yeah. Played so I played, I played the mirror against uh, Michael. He also top eight of the GP. Michael uh, Cochran. Sure. So I played the mirror against him and. It was mostly a massacre. I mean, I 2 would him pretty easily. Uh, we actually had a pretty interesting game, too, where I actually think he and I both think that he probably wins that game if he didn't cast the Scarab God at any point. Because he yeah. was winning on board pretty easily, and he, he the, the only way he could lose was Confiscation Coup. So, one thing that's interesting is he had a kind of similar game plan to yours. Yeah, his, this was actually shockingly similar. To yeah, the, he did have Confiscation Coup. Right. He had one upgrade, one... He had consigned to Oblivion instead of commit to memory. Right, yeah. But it is a though. similar... It yeah. feels a similar role. 
I agree. Yeah, looking at his list, it was it was shockingly similar. Yeah. Especially considering how our game games played out. Like, so the cards that I actually saw him play were the PNLR and the Champion of Wits, which were kind of which are kind of just like the little miser things. Yeah. So his deck looked pretty different when we played the match. I didn't know that he had Confiscation Coup. I didn't know that yeah. he had, you know. When when you think about his list, the reason you might have won is actually the Confiscation Coup uh, arms race. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the the two Confiscation Coups definitely gives us an advantage in the mirror. Um, for what it's worth, I think the one Confiscation Coup gave him an, the advantage in most mirrors. Sure. No, it probably does, right? <laughs> like, this is what uh, Michael talked about in our, in our podcast this week is like, I don't know that I would play Grace again because I don't want to get caught in that confiscation coup arms race. Yeah, I mean, I agree. It's mostly the end of the game whenever it happens to you, so it's probably better to just play a deck that doesn't... That doesn't fold to it, yeah. <laughs> um, so he's playing more Planeswalkers as well. So if, as a key moment, did you feel like the extra confiscation cues and the Dire Fleets as your top end was better than the Planeswalkers? Um... I would say the Dire Fleets are not better in that matchup. I would say the Confiscation Coups definitely are, so I, it's a little bit of a... I'm interested by that, because, like, when I think about the mirror match, you know, if I'm looking at my opponent's removal spells, Dire Fleet seems very good. It, it can be good. The thing is, like, you actually just rarely end up with not enough removal spells in the mirror. Okay. You're running almost as I mean, many you're, I mean, you're playing 14 right, spells, like, so it's yeah. it's it makes a little bit of sense. We're like literally both of our lists are only playing one more creature than removal spells. Actually, less, right? Because the yeah, I mean, if you in, if you include there's literally there's literally one creatures. there's one less removal spell right. in his list than your list. Right. So it could be that Dire Fleet doesn't fill that role as well as I as well as I'm hoping. So we we finished twelve zero, uh, not finish, but we're twelve zero. Started twelve zero. We're twelve zero. We lose our next two. Yes. And then we get the pair up, quote unquote. Yes, I, I, I mean, wasn't even quote unquote. I actually got the pair up. Like he was, yeah. he was X one one. You, you go in Cifro, Um It's pretty clear to me and to you, as your text messages have indicated, right. that you're you're locked for top eight when you draw this this match. Yeah, I mean, I was mostly sure that I could you're, lock you're, top eight with a draw after I won round twelve. Yeah. Um, but it did actually get a lot more dicey after I lost the next two. Yeah. So obviously you're on top eight at this point. Uh, your match against Tendrum. To me, it wasn't looking close. Um, no, we definitely didn't play close games. And it was super awkward because he had more... Like, I think his main deck was a lot more tuned for the matchup than mine was. He had yeah. double search for Ascanta and things like that. Um, and he actually did play a search for Ascanta on turn two in game one. And I was like, oh, I guess I'm going to probably lose this match. And won that game easily. Yeah. So. What, what, what do you think is the key decisions that caused you to win that game? Um, I'm... I'm Imagining that he probably kept a pretty landlight hand with the search for Escanta because of the fact that he was binning so many pretty valuable spells off of yeah. it. Uh, he binned a Varaska's Content, and um, I don't recall exactly what the other it, His list been. does have two gear holds, though. Sure, I mean, he could have been trying to play for gear hold, but it was it was super awkward because basically I I played uh, I played Scarab God on 5, which was met with a Varaska's Content, and then he jammed his own Scarab God, which was met with Confiscation Coup. He had my list and had played against Michael already that day. Yeah. So he definitely. I mean, not only had he played against Michael, but apparently your play sequences were very similar. Were very similar. Sure. So do you think that that's a lapse in Andrew's judgment, or do you think that he's like, and Michael got lucky? It's possible that he just you know was willing to play. It, it's hard to actually not play the Scarab God into in the crew. The, the reason that I don't want to do it, though, is because I think it's actually the only way you can lose the game with Sir Travis yeah. I mean, he has zero coups. I mean, he does have two more instances and one more search than you. Right. So, like, I, I mean, if we're looking at lists, right, like if you were going to play tomorrow, you might be actually closer to Andrew's list with one or two coups. Sure. I mean, or maybe just... Not playing this deck. I'd like I, again, like I don't know that this is where I want to be because you do end up in the awkward spot in any kind of mirror where you're like, I just actually can't cast the Scarab God if I'm ahead because right, you know, it's, it's the only way I can lose. It's the only way I can lose. Right. So uh, let's talk about your next nice finest match. Uh, we have a tweet from uh, Casey Bloodworth that is literally uh, that you know, quote, I hate Carnage Tyrant. Right. And then why quote Why is Carnage Ty Tyrant printed? Um, so you won game one off camera. Yes. So the, when I tuned in, you were up a game. Uh, I saw him cast the Tyrant. Kind of I didn't, I thought about your deck list, turn, kind of turned it off because it was at family dinner. What happened from there? Yeah, so I mean, game one was pretty uneventful. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, again, too, I felt like I had actually played. You were really far I, ahead. I played really well and nickel and dime some huge advantages. Yeah, like, I mean, it felt like he. I, had, I, I didn't actually. I couldn't think of a way that I could lose that game. At no, that that's how I felt too. Like when I when watching the game, I was like, I don't know how Matt loses this yeah, game. Yeah, it's certainly. But it's going to be impressive. And, and then yeah, it was just Carnage Chart by itself, and I was like, oh man, this is so bad though. I just can't win the game now. Like, yeah. It was like well, it was like Carnage Chart and then like Resilient Kenra and then Arnarthur Resilient Kenra. Yeah, it was it was too much power and toughness that couldn't be interacted with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what happened in what happened Game 3? So, Game 3, he's actually winning for the vast majority of the game. Um, his hand lined up particularly well against my Game 3 hand. I ended up having to make some pretty awkward decisions on which removal spells to use. Um, so we get into the board state where he ends up with double shot, or er, sorry, rekindling Phoenix in play. Yeah. And I'm at a pretty low life total where I can't, like, you know, afford to take a lot of hits with sure. from rekindling Phoenixes. And he attacks with both, and I was able to rask his contempt. And I just, like, lose the game at basically any point to this Blossoming Fence if he has it. Yeah. Um, but it's only a one. I'm in a sideboard, so I'm not, like, super playing around it. Um, so anyway, rask his contempt, the rekindling Phoenix, and he goes in the tank for a, a little while, right? Sure. Where were we? Okay, so I can't really afford to take a lot of hit for both these rekindling Phoenixes, so I decided to rask his contempt one. Yeah. Um... And he goes in the tank for a while, so, you know, I assume that he's thinking about some kind of removal spell to try to stop me from, you know, exiling completely. Alex not to. Um, so, he hits me with the Chandra's, or the Rekindling Phoenix, I'm not sure exactly what my life total is. But I have the Scarab God in my hand, and I have a search for Azkanta active. I bend something that's not a land, sure. and find my fifth land. And I think about casting this, the Scarab God for a minute, and decide not to, because I have Chandra's Defeat in my hand. Yeah. And... If you saw in game two, he was able to struggle to survive my Scarab God, so it was yeah. like pretty fresh in my mind. It's like, okay, well, what I actually need to do here is take this hit this time, then be able to um, play the Scarab God with six mana, yeah. pulling a red up, and then hopefully Harness use the struggle. Fighting. No, hopefully use the struggle to survive, and then I was able to Chandra's defeat the Rekindling Phoenix. Oh, for with six, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I passed the turn. Um, he hits me with that, then plays a Death Watch Scavenger, and I was like, oh man, that's gonna be really brutal because now he doesn't have to use the survive mode, right? Right. Um, but anyway, I draw my six land, play my Scarab God, and he goes, okay, you know, first main phase uh, struggle, and I was like, that's fine, and he's like, he, he thinks for like just a half a second, and then he's like, survive, and I was like, okay, response, you know, Chandra's defeat your Rekindling Phoenix, and I had killed the, and no, I must not have killed the Scavenger yet, so I still get hit with the Scavenger down to eight, I believe. Yeah. Um, so what do you think your mistake is here? So, yeah, the, we're going into that. So the very next turn, um, somehow we end up on a completely... Empty board. I'm not exactly sure what happened to the Death Gorge Scavenger, but it definitely went away somehow. It had to be the Harness Lightning, right? Uh, no, I had a Whirl Every Show, so I played Oh, block. sure, sure, sure. So it was, sure. was so a block. Yeah, it was a block. That's what it was. Um, so anyway, so we go to my next turn. I have Whirl Every Show, so three energy, a search for Azkanta, and play six lands, and my hand is currently the Scarab God Harness Lightning against... Yeah. Uh, and, you, and you reveal a Swamp off your search. Right. And he has, like, I, I believe... One or no cards in hand? Yeah. So Michael told you not to say this story, so are we going to do it? Yeah, I don't care. Okay, go for it. So anyway, my hand at this point in the game, although you can't see it on camera, is the Scarab God and Harness Lightning. So I immediately am thinking I have to draw Vraska's Contempt to deal with this, because uh, I have six lands in play. So if I draw Vraska's Contempt, I can deal with this uh, Ronus and then also deal with the... The 1-1. One, one. No, he has a... He oh, has, no one, sorry. No, he has the Earthshaker kind of in the graveyard. That's what it was. Oh, you were considering him flashing back the Earthshaker. Yeah, I, I knew he was going to. Like, yeah, it was, it sure, was because then he gets to attack for nine. Right, because I have the Whirler in play. Yeah. So anyway, so I, I bend the Swamp off the top and then draw Chandra for turn. And I was like, okay, this is actually pretty good. So I can play the Chandra, um, take it up this turn, and hopefully I don't... I was so actually hoping I didn't hit anything relevant because it would tell, you know, tell my hand a little bit better. Yeah. I fortunately hit a land, brought him to... Uh, some pretty low life total, I felt. Um, and then my plan was just to harness lightning the Earthshaker kind of pre-combat so that you couldn't attack with yeah, the... The Ronus. The Ronus, right. And I feel like from that point, you know, I guess to just play the Scarab God plus Chandra for mana, you know, make something at the end yeah. of turn, or on my own turn, and, like, the game's mostly, you know, out of his control at that point. Um, he ends up drawing Blossoming Defense and kills me. So... So he Blossoming Defense the, Ur the, the Earthshaker, Earthshaker Kenner, right? yeah, in response to the harness lightning. And the reason that it killed me was because I only had two actual red sources in the Aetherum. So I had because to, you, I had to go down to yeah, I had to go down to two energy to be able to harness lightning the Kenra. So like I wasn't able to make a Thopter. Um, he did miss his Kenra trigger, so I could have actually blocked, but it didn't seem worth continuing to play that game. Yeah. So um, but so, so if, if you I, keep if the swamp, swamp right, if I kept the swamp, I could have played the the Scarab God, 
not used both my reds, so I could have still had red for Harness Lightning. So I, you know, then I have the Scarab God, a Whirler, and a Thopter, all against you know Ronas and Earth Shaker Kenra plus Blossoming Defense. So I, yeah. I go to I go to Harness Lightning there, Shaker Kenra, presumably he Blossoming Defenses. defenses. Yeah. Um, I'm able to block it with the Thopter token, take the five from Ronas, go to three, and yeah. then I just and have, then you untap the Scarab God. the Scarab God, yeah. Yeah. So obviously this is your first Pro Tour invite. Congratulations. Thank you. Where. Where do you go from, like, this feeling of ultimate power, right? Like, that's that's what it's got to feel like, right? Like, I mean, I, I remember I was 8-1 at a GP. I lost my first two rounds to knock myself out of top eight. Win, win, win. I'm like, this sucks so bad. Like, I played so well this entire tournament. Yeah, I mean... I've... I I cannot believe I'm not going to be in top eight contention. What... Like, yeah, I've definitely been in that situation before. Actually, like I said, just the last the last GP I played in with uh, Tron or whatever, I started yeah. at eight and one, lost the first two, and then won four in a row. And I was like, yeah, oh. It's like, man, it's so, it, it's actually <laughs> the worst feeling. You're like, I played so well, I did so much, I got a little unlucky to make it. Right. And obviously, things broke your way, and like, you gotta get that. I mean, things definitely broke your way in the last round. Like, no, I mean, got, they, they broke my way a lot of times over that tournament. Like. What? I, I sorry. I actually, so amazingly enough, I won one out of the fifteen die rolls over the weekend. That's or great. I guess I get yeah. I guess fourteen die rolls because I didn't play that. Yeah, sure. Play you didn't play the last one. Right. It, it is. Is it something but that I ran so hot in my actual games though? Is it something that you care about going into Phoenix? You'd be a player to watch. Um, I don't know if that's true. Like one well, GP top eight doesn't. If, really if you the if you start out well, you'll be a player to watch. Sure. I mean, and, if and, I started out six and zero or whatever. Yeah. But, and and I think that the thing is is that um, this is something that you and I and Michael and I have talked about a lot, and even a little bit with Danny. Um, you know, when we think about players in Utah that have done well, it's like these are players that start attending every Grand Prix they can. Right. Like it is it is a numbers game because you can have those finishes where you played well all weekend long, and you finish X three or X four. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no guarantees in Magic. I mean, it's just it's mostly about putting yourself in the positions as many times as you can. Is no, that's exactly right. <laughs> and how how do you encourage those players that are that feel like that feel like they're ready to take that next step? I mean, I you mean, felt I, you felt that way for that, years. Yeah. What I would say is that my results haven't you know panned out for you know quite a while. But I I would also say that I haven't taken it as seriously as I did in my mind. Right. Like. In my mind, I felt like I was really giving myself all these opportunities, but I wasn't, right? Like, you know, yeah. I'd go to, like, three GPs a year or whatever. and yeah. Sure. It, it is a numbers game, and it's something that you have to say to yourself, I'm, I'm going to go to every GP within this driving distance, within this flight distance. <coughs> and, uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you. I think that your list was super awesome. I love the Dire Fleets. I love the one of package. And, uh, yeah, I hope that people got something out of this. Um... Yeah, so too. Hopefully it was more than just, you know, me rambling off. I, no, I mean, this was better than any tournament report I've ever read, so... I mean, it has to be better than my interview, so... <laughs> <laughs> also, Magic Jesus cut his hair, yeah. so I'm sorry to everybody, but thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to check out patreon.com slash ccmdg, as well as... This will be on puremptature.com, so don't forget to check out MTU Traders. Um, and we'll see you guys all next week for another Wednesday Night Wire. Bye, everybody. Thanks.